Okay. Thank you, Karis. Okay, good morning, everyone in England uh, and in, in Britain and wherever else, if you're in that uh, time zone, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction and, and also for the, uh, for the invitation to, um, to talk um, about this uh, research, the research that we've been doing in, on the island of Sulawesi in Indonesia. Um, now, when most people think of Ice Age art, of course, they think of the fantastic uh, cave art from, uh, from Upper Paleolithic Europe, Western Europe um, in particular. Uh, this is, you know, some of the most famous prehistoric art in the world. Uh, and in particular, um, uh, you know, obviously really well known are the, um, the, the figurative representations of animals known from the Upper Paleolithic art of Europe. Um, from the famous site of um, Lusco, of course, and Altamira and uh, Chauvet in France and Spain. And uh, this, of course, is a map of Ice Age um, Europe as things, uh, as the situation looked when the sea levels were much lower. Now, the earliest known um, figurative representations of, of animals in, in Europe so far seem to be from Chauvet Cave that around about 35,000 years ago for, I think, a uh, uh, radiocarbon dates on charcoal pigment from a um, painting of a uh, image of a rhinoceros. And we also find the amazing 3D carvings, um, figurative representations of, of animals and um, possible therianthropes. I'll have a little bit more to talk about that later. This um, carved image of a, um, a human with the body of a lion, uh, the head of a lion. There's some really amazing work there coming from. Uh, from the Swabian district in particular in, in Germany, 40 to 30,000 years ago, these excavated findings. Uh, and then based on the, the rock art dating, uranium series rock art dating from the um, Alistair Pike and Dirk Hoffman team, there's um, a minimum age on, of around about 37,000 years ago for, on a hand stencil from El Castillo in Northern Spain, as well as I think published in 2011, this, uh, um, sprayed red disc, uh, which again, minimum uranium series age of around about 41,000. Uh, so this seems to correspond roughly with the, the time our species first arrives in, uh, first enters Europe. Uh, and uh, also a really interesting claim, provocative claim for a much uh, older evidence for rock art production going back to around about 65,000 years ago in, um, in Spain, which of course would suggest that uh, this would be Neanderthals who are creating um, rock art, which is a really interesting claim at around about 65,000 uh, years ago for non-figurative rock art. So um, non-representational imagery. I think the oldest uh, dated image is for a hand stencil. Um, now, when we think of Ice Age art, we don't often think of uh, tropical Indonesia. Uh, but the research I've been doing with uh, uh, many colleagues from Indonesia and, and also from Australia has, um, has made that, you know, our findings have, have made that claim, um, uh, you know, that we have rock art at around about the same age, if not earlier in time, than the, um, uh, the non-Neanderthal rock art in um, cave art in Upper Paleolithic Europe, which is a really... Uh, interesting um, proposition given, you know, that the, the evidence from Europe has long dominated our understanding of, of Paleolithic art. And in fact, um, some of the recent findings we've made uh, in Sulawesi, on the island of Sulawesi with early rock art, um, dating early rock art, uh, has, you know, the prestigious journal Science ranks it as among some of the top 10 um, scientific discoveries made in the year that we published them, 2014 and 2020 which um, when you look at, say, over the last 16 years or so, the, the science's annual top 10 breakthroughs of the year award um, or list, uh, you know, it's only a handful of times that any discoveries related to human evolution have made the, the top 10 list in, a, in any given year. And, um, and so we're, you know, joining pretty yeah, illustrious findings, such as the discovery of Homo floresiensis, the sequencing of the Neanderthal genome, and then the discovery of the Denisovan the genetic legacy of the Denisovan hominins. So, yeah, it's um, I guess showing some of the 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 um, you know this is a you know 
unexpected and novel finding this notion of ice age art in Europe in uh, sorry in um, Indonesia so just to put you in the the part of the world where um, where, where we're making these discoveries here is the ice age map of uh, the island Southeast Asian region at, at around about a, you know the last glacial maximum when the sea levels were at their um, the at their lowest and at this time we had uh, all of island uh, uh, southeast most of island southeast asia forming you know forming this large continental landmass projecting from the southeastern corner of uh, of uh, eurasia essentially this uh, landmass was known as sunda and then on the other side uh, we have uh, australia uh, joining to uh, papua, new, papua new guinea forming a landmass known as sahul and then there's a series of isolated oceanic islands in between these two land masses uh, known as uh, Wallacea. And so none of the islands of Wallacea were ever connected to the land masses of either Sunda or Sahel, even during the lowest periods of sea level. And here we have uh, a bi major biogeographical boundary known as the Wallace Line. So islands to the east, the oceanic islands to the east of the Wallace Line, essentially, you know, the, the Wallace line represents the easternmost uh, distribution or extent of the distinctive um, continental fauna and flora of uh, Asia. So the islands in this region, and then there's the island of Sulawesi, which is the largest uh, island in Wallacea. So as a result of this um, very, very, um, very important biogeographical boundary, we see that the, um, the faunal communities especially the mammals in Wallacea are very uh, unique okay so it's very it's been very difficult for any non-flying land mammals from continental Asia to cross the Wallace line into the Wallacean islands and it's been equally difficult for non-flying land mammals from the marsupial and monotreme fauna of Sahul to, to get across to any of these thousands of islands in Wallacea so through over a very long period of geological time, this has resulted in, in these oceanic islands having very depauperate and um, highly insular faunas. And, and uh, you know, you can see here these this figures at the top, um, you know, compared with the adjacent continent of Sunda and then Sahul, these, you know, very low species richness on these islands. So it's very distinctive faunas that have been isolated for a very long period of time in some cases, we find species surviving there that have no surviving relatives in the uh, in either adjacent mainland. Now, Sulawesi is because it's the largest island in Wallacea, and it's also the oldest, uh, and it's quite close to the Sahul uh, to the Sunda landmass. It's probably the most biodiverse in terms of the the mammal communities, at least on the island. You know, the major mammal biomass consists of rats and bats, but there is a small number of uh, of, um, of mammals that have got across, non-flying land mammals uh, from the, the oriental fauna of classic oriental fauna or Asian fauna of uh, Sunda, including some, a couple of species of pigs as well as um, civet cats and various other things like that. But the important thing about Sulawesi is that almost all of the land mammals found on the island are endemic to Sulawesi. They're not found anywhere else. So there's really quite an extraordinary fauna. Now, these are the, the top three, if you like, of the, of the large mammal species that are still surviving today. There were earlier um, uh, Pleistocene species that are, that are now extinct, but these are the, the three largest endemic uh, land, faun, uh, land mammals. We have the, uh, the, the Anoa, which is essentially a type of dwarf or, or miniature buffalo. They stand about a metre high. Uh, very cute, but very dangerous. Uh, and then we have the highly enigmatic Barbirusa, which is, uh, yeah, it's a very mysterious uh, pig. Um, and it has these bizarre, the males, the mature males have these bizarre um, upper canines or tusks that are recurved. So they essentially reverse in their sockets and then start to grow in this ornate spiral, forming these very bizarre set of tusks, a very curious looking creature, uh, usually hairless. And then we have uh, the, the Sulawesi warty pig, which is a, the only um, 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 uh, pig from the genus Sus on the island. And they're quite a, uh, the, the, the smallest out of these three uh, mammals. And they're, they're quite, still quite widespread on the island. And they're characterized by uh, three sets of facial warts. 
Uh, now, when we look at other sorts of mammal fauna on the island, we do have evidence for some form of what we think is um, occupation by an archaic hominid species. We don't have any fossils from these hominids, but we do have stone artifacts uh, excavated from a site called Talipu in the, in the south of Sulawesi. And uh, through a series of dating methods, we estimate that uh, these deposits containing the stone artifacts were laid down between around 200 to 100,000 years ago, which doesn't entirely rule out the possibility of early Homo sapiens, uh, you know, given that we now know that the origins of Homo sapiens in Africa are much earlier than we'd previously believed. Uh, but it, you know, of all the likely candidates, you know, yeah, you know, Homo erectus or Homo floresiensis, the Danisovans, as well as this mysterious new species from the Philippines, Homo luzonensis, were all in that that part of the world um, at, at around about that time. So, yeah, it's a real mystery as to, to who the who the first uh, inhabitants of the island uh, were. But it, importantly, it, it suggests that hominids were able to get across the Wallace Line to Sulawesi, as indeed they were to uh, the Wallacean island of Flores to the south with the famous Homo floresiensis. Um, so yeah, watch this space in terms of who these who these uh, hominids were. Now, in terms of our species. We think that um, uh, we, we, there is some evidence for Homo sapiens um, fossil evidence in the form of a couple of teeth from a cave called Lida Air in uh, Sumatra on the very um, southern uh, extent of the Sunda landmass. And uh, that is around about 73 to 63,000 years ago, it appears. Um, we have uh, modern, homo, uh, modern humans there. And then uh, across the Wallace line on the very northern part of Sahul, um, we have a site called Majabebe, uh, which has yielded not yet any definite human remains, but abundant uh, behavioural evidence, archaeological evidence, suggesting quite clearly that this was modern humans in deposits around about 70 to 60, but 65,000 is probably the, the best uh, date for them. So what this suggests, if, if we have humans present, our species present in Sahul about 65,000 years ago, then it's, you know, they had to have gone through Wallace here to get to, uh, to colonize Australia. So it's suggesting that we've got, you know, in, on the island of Sulawesi, we, we, we've got humans there at least 65,000 years ago, our species, we think. Given that there's a couple of ideas about which um, island hopping routes that our species might have taken to get through Wallace here, uh, there's been conjecture about it being the southern route. Um, uh, essentially from west to east from Java along the Lesser Sunda Islands and through Timor into northern Australia or a northern route which would take them from Borneo uh, through Sulawesi and then into the very northern tip of Sahul which would be um, in the Indonesian West Papua province today. Now based on modelling and various other data it's probably the case that the northern route is the most likely um, uh, um, pathway, if you like, island hopping pathway taken by our species. You have to go through Sulawesi to get uh, along the northern route. So 65,000 years ago, we expect to find evidence possibly for humans at that, uh, at that period of time, our species. So to take you to um, uh, the part of Sulawesi where we found the rock art, it's in a region, a limestone, a limestone tower cast region uh, known as Maros. This is an area, it's about 450 square kilometres of a lowland tower cast. It's about, located about 20 kilometres inland on this coastal plain. Very, very beautiful landscape. Uh, you have all of these isolated cast towers as well as these uh, large hill masses uh, formed by cast towers that have not yet separated. And it's just riddled with limestone caves and rock shelters. Uh, it's just, yeah, really an incredible, um, incredibly rich archaeological environment. Uh, now, Maros, uh, the very first um, um, representations in, in sort of recent European history of the, the caves and in this region date back to 1745. Um, it, of course, Indonesia was a Dutch colony at that time, and Maros was actually quite a popular destination for um, Dutch and other European tourists from the nearby um, Port city of Makassar, and so they would come into the cat caves and explore them, and and uh, there's waterfalls also coming out of some of the caves. So it's quite a popular spot, and they did some beautiful uh, drawings of the caves. But bizarrely, that well, interestingly, they didn't they didn't 
well, they saw, they must have seen the rock art because we've seen Dutch graffiti dating as early as the 1700s over the top of rock art, but there's no um, documenta documentation of that rock art as far as we're aware. So it's they saw it but didn't observe it, which is interesting. Um, and just as a brief side note, I should note that this, the first drawings of any caves in Maros uh, in European history were by a, a French uh, draftsman known as uh, Jean, Jean Michel Aubert. Uh, and as it turns out, the, the guy who would eventually, uh, working with my, uh, me and my colleagues, would, would eventually date the rock art hundreds of years later is another Aubert, uh, Maxime Aubert. And as far as we can tell, another itinerant. French-speaking person. As far as we can tell, there's probably been no other Auberts that have ever set foot in Maros in the intervening century. So it's uh, one of those bizarre coincidences that you come across uh, from time to time. Now, the rock art itself, it's, it's located in hundreds of caves and rock shelters in the Maros casts. Locals have known about it for a long time, as we can gather from very fragmentary um, oral traditions and also some uh, customs of local people putting their handprints on the um, on the pillars of new homes when they build them. Our local villages do that. But it was first discovered or, or reported by Western science in 1952 by a Dutch um, <coughs> archaeologist known as Ben, he ben Heikren. And he was the first person uh, to, to um, report the presence of these hand stencils as well as the figurative animal art. Now, <coughs> the, the thing is though, the, the rock art at the time and until quite recently, was not thought to be that old. So it's kind of hard to find any uh, any references, many references to it in, in, in text, classic rock art textbooks. It was, it's been overlooked. It's been very well studied and intensively studied in, in Indonesia, quite well known in Indonesia amongst the very passionate local archeologists in particular. Um, but it just wasn't very well known outside that region. And where people had considered the age or where researchers had pondered the, the antiquity of the rock art, it was, uh, no one thought that it could have been Ice Age or, or Pleistocene in, in antiquity. The most commonly accepted notion was that it probably was created by a group of, um, a rather mysterious group of pre-Neolithic foragers, um, essentially the local equivalent of the Mesolithic um, phase known as Tuwalians, um, or probably um, uh, created by the Neolithic farmers of, of uh, Austronesian origin who, who spread into island Southeast Asia from Southern China around about 4,000 years ago and essentially initiated the, uh, the Neolithic farming transition. <clears throat> so it wasn't thought to be that old. Um, so I guess this brings me uh, to where I come into the story. In 2011, I'd been excavating a, um, one of the rock art sites in Maros. Um, this is a site that had first been dug back in the 70s and it um, suggested that, you know, the evidence from this site suggested that modern humans had first arrived in Sulawesi around about 30 or 40,000 years ago. So I went back there with, uh, with my Indonesian collaborators with the notion of digging down much deeper to see, you know, how much earlier human occupation at the site what, uh, went back to. Um, so my, my primary focus was on the um, on the excavations, but you know on the on the weekends off or on the Sundays off from the dig, I would often explore all the local rock art sites, and, and I was just really struck by how much rock art is is in Maros, you know, and and you know there just wasn't really much written about it, and, and no one had really thought too much about how old it could be. Um, so I'd, I'd always sort of had a real interest in you know how how old is it? You know, could it be Pleistocene potentially? Um, so I was always looking for a way of, um, you know, of dating the rock art, but as I'm sure you're all aware, dating rock art is notoriously difficult. Um, the, sorry, I should note that there's, you know, lots of hand stencils. This early art is characterized by hand stencils, as well as these large figurative animal paintings. You see on the left there, you can see um, what I would regard as a fairly, compl or a fairly complex um, uh, animal painting. And on the right, you also see much simpler ones. Um, but generally, this seems to be a um, you know fairly common occurrence in the sites. This uh, large figure of animal paintings, although they're much rarer than the hand stencils. Um, and then, you know, with this notion of trying to figure out how we could possibly date this art, um, you know, constantly musing over this um, this problem. One day in 2011, one day uh, we uh, explored a site called Liang Jarie, which means Cave of the Fingers, and it's filled with hand stencils. 
um, and we were sort of having a look around and I started to notice that some of these hand stencils had these weird nodular growths over the top of them. Um, I just put that hit in D stretch here. So you see the, um, the growths a little bit more clearly. I've, you know, I'm indicating them here with the mouse. So they were kind of like little nodular, uh, hard um, uh, popcorn-like growths. Uh, and it turns out later that they're, well, we discovered later that they're known as coralloid spiliothems. Essentially, they're like little miniature stalactites or stalagmites that form through calcium carbonate precipitation on the limestone walls and ceilings. And very fortunately for us, they were... Um, in very rare cases, they formed over the top of the, uh, the cave paintings, on top of the cave art. Uh, and it, it, colloquially, they're known as cave popcorn, or well, in caving nomenclature, uh, they're known as cave popcorn because they do look like little popcorn growths. So this was quite an exciting observation because for the first time, it seemed as though there was a possibility that we might be able to um, uh, start to look at establishing some ages for this rock art if it turned out that we were able to uh, date the formation of the, um, the, you know, the formation time of these little popcorn growths, which is where Max Aubert comes in to the story. Now, uh, the year before, Max had been shoved into my already overcrowded office at the University of Wollongong, where I was a postdoc at, at that time. And, uh, and, you know, through chatting with Max, he started telling me about his speciality, which was using calcium carbonate deposits inside limestone caves to, to date rock art. So obviously this was quite a uh, fortuitous and exciting um, union, if you like. And I showed him photos, I came back from the field, showed him photos of the, uh, these little popcorn growths on the cave art and he became very excited about that and immediately uh, came back with me to, uh, to Sulawesi and we collected a series. We explored a whole bunch of um, uh, cave art sites in Maros um, and collected a series of popcorns from over the top of, uh, of the cave art of various individual motifs. Um, and just to show you here, you can see a close up of one of the sampling sites that uh, where Max took a sample of the popcorn. So you can see indicated here where you can see the, the red paint here from, uh, this was a hand stencil, I believe. Um, so you can see all the red paint here and you can see where a popcorn had then formed on top of the hand stencil and then Max cut through that popcorn uh, into the, through the, um, this, through the patch of pigment and into the underlying rock face, the canvas in which the, uh, the hand stencil was made. And you can clearly see continuing here with the, with the painted uh, rock face, you can see the line of pigment um, above which the popcorn is formed. Uh, and then it comes all the way through here. And so using a method known as uranium series dating, which is essentially the same thing that Pike and Hoffman's team did to establish the early rock art ages in, um, in, uh, in um, Spain. Yeah, they managed to get some really early dates. So uh, basically we've um, managed to get minimum ages uh, and maximum ages for the rock art. So it's really interesting. And here you can see the cross sections here. Uh, where we've got a series of dates uh, above the um, above the uh, the pigment layers themselves. For the first uh, period, we dated 19 individual cave popcorn samples from over the top of 12 hand stencil motifs and two animal um, uh, paintings. This resulted in uh, the first paper um, published in Nature. We have a uh, we got a minimum age of 35,000 for a figurative representation of a pig and minimum age of 40,000 for a hand stencil from the same rock art panel. Uh, and then fast forward through time, we had a very new exciting discovery at another site called Leon Bulu Sipong 4. And this uh, was this amazing hunting scene. This is the, um, the WhatsApp message that my Indonesian colleague who discovered, one of the guys who discovered it, uh, sent me the message, which is just an incredible finding. Here you can see a close up of this uh, Anoa being hunted by these little, uh, half human, half animal uh, like creatures. And that yielded a uh, minimum age of 44,000 uh, based on it's part of, uh, it was essentially a large um, scene that we've interpreted involving multiple figures. We've interpreted it as a hunting scene. Uh, and we've got four uh, popcorns that we dated and the oldest minimum age was 44,000. Again, depicting um, Anoas and uh, Sulawesi Wati pig. 
Uh, and also, yeah, you can see a close up here just to show some of the details of this, um, this little group of human like figures hunting this uh, dwarf bovid, this Anoa. And just close up here, they're quite simply represent, uh, quite simply drawn, but they seem to have, you know, these figures seem to have attributes of both humans and animals, including a beak like head and a tail on the other creature there. Here's another one here, um, another sort of creature hunting a, um, a Noah. It has sort of a, a melange of um, um, attributes from different types of creatures. This one's a little bit more difficult to uh, discern. Uh, and here's a close up of the um, one of the figures we interpret as a Darien throat uh, with the tail. <coughs> now, uh, another finding we've made is at a site called Liang Tadonge, uh, which we've dated a um, this beautiful painting, relatively complete painting of the Sulawesi Wati pig, to at least uh, forty five thousand five hundred years ago. So this is the um, as far as we can tell, one of the probably the oldest figurative representation, um, you know, that, that has been dated so far. It's part of a larger uh, scene with three um, three warty pigs. Here's some close-ups here just to show the beautiful way the uh, facial features are rendered in this um, art style. Uh, and also, we've dated. I should just mention quickly on the island of Borneo, we've dated some of the. Uh, uh, a hand stencil to 37,000 using the same method and also a figurative representation of a, of a wild bovid to around about 40,000. So we've got rock art essentially on both sides of the Wallace line at around about 40,000, if not earlier, but in Sulawesi. Um, so look, you know, what does all this, what does this mean potentially? There's this outdated notion that um, uh, there was some sort of a uh, around about 40,000 years ago, there was some sort of acceleration in, in human thought and spirituality, if you like, that seems to have been focused in, in Europe. And the cave art of Europe has always been a big part of that story. Now that we have cave art at roughly the same period of time on the other side of the world in Indonesia, you know, one possibility is that we had two separate um, efflorescences, if you like, of, of, um, of human um, artistic um, genius, if you like, you know, two creative explosions on the opposite side of the world. I don't really hold to that notion. In my belief, I think what we're seeing here is much earlier. Uh, this is a safer theory, of course, uh, a much earlier um, um, evolution of, of um, figurative art and, and cave art traditions in Africa, possibly, I mean, who knows how far back it goes, but we haven't found any really early figurative art in Africa yet. But I suspect that these are this was part of the cultural baggage our, our species uh, took with them from Africa. Okay, now also this is really interesting uh, uh, when we look at this hunting scene that we found in um, dated to 44,000 years ago at one of the sites. This here is the, of course the famous, um, uh, what is it called? The scene in the shaft at Losco in France. And this is, um, depicts two things that are very rare in the Paleolithic art of Europe. That is a therianthrope, a part human, part animal being. You see this male figure here with the, the head of a bird uh, and also a, a narrative composition or a scene, you know, like a, a, uh, a story that's really playing out in, these, in the, in the, in the juxta, juxtaposition of these, uh, these two, this, this human-like and this, this animal figure. This is a scene, you know, this is telling a story of some kind. As for what the story is, of course, a lot of ink has been spilt about that, but it, we know that it's telling some sort of a story. Now, therianthropes, of course, are very well known in the folklore and religious beliefs of people throughout the world. These are only a handful of the many examples that are known. Um, but, you know, at, they have all sorts of meanings, obviously, but uh, at, at, at least for our perspective, from our perspective, the importance is that they show us that these early artists had the ability to conceive of the existence of, uh, of supernatural beings, which is which is a really uh, which is a really interesting thing given the uh, given the uh, given period of time that we're talking about. Okay, so when we look at the earliest known image of a of a therianthrope in Europe, uh, you know the the the, the current claim is um, is centered around this beautiful um, uh, um, carved section of a of a um, mammoth tusk. Uh, from uh, from Germany, it's dated to around about 40,000 to 39,000 years ago. Although there has been some, uh, as always in archaeology, some people doubting the uh, the age of this this object. <coughs> um, but it's it's 
generally accepted to be the oldest known image of a therianthrope in Europe. Now, it appears to portray a, um, a being with the, the body of a, uh, of a human in the head of a cave lion, uh, suggesting it is some sort of early therianthrope. Now, there's been a recent um, claim, though, by Paul Barn that it is not a therianthrope, but, but a more straightforward representation of a standing bear. Um, so I don't really know if that's the case or not, but I think most scholars currently accept this image as the oldest known depiction of a, of a therianthrope in Europe. Uh, okay, so I mean, when we look then at, at the evidence that is emerging from, uh, from this new cave site in Sulawesi, Lian Bulu Sipong 4, uh, at least when we look at these two quite rare elements of, of, um, of Paleolithic art worldwide, the use of narrative scenes and the depiction of therianthropes, <coughs> you know, it, it, it seems as though at least narrative scenes are, are much earlier in, in Sulawesi than what we find so far in Europe. Um, you know, they don't, scenes don't, you know, I'm sure someone in England can correct me, but scenes don't seem to become relatively common, although they're always quite rare, but they don't seem to become relatively common until towards the end of the, um, of the Upper Paleolithic period in the rock art and, and in the mobile art as well. Um, uh, and also the images of therianthropes, at least if we, if we uh, you know, um, if we accept that this um, famous lion man figurine is a therianthrope and it is dated to around about 40,000, then at least a few thousand years earlier, it seems we have depictions of, of conceptually similar imaginary beings in, in Sulawesi on the other side of the world. Now, I mean, you know, what, what does this mean? Well, to me, what, what, we're, what we're looking at here is, you know, with this rock art scene painted at least 44,000 years ago in Sulawesi, is, you know, this, this seems to be the earliest evidence we have for people using pictures to tell stories. <clears throat> the earliest known surviving dated evidence for this, you know, from this, for this universal behavior today. But, you know, the important thing is, you know, if this is evidence for storytelling, this is not just people telling stories about what they hunted last week. You know, it, it, it's not about, well, this is just a straightforward hunting narrative, you know, about events that actually happen. These are, these are depictions, it seems, of, 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 of creatures and of beings that are conjured, you know, from deep in the human imagination. Um, you know, from the, you know, these are, um, these are subjects or, or, or characters in, in narrative fiction, if you like, in folklore, myths, beliefs, you know, religious beliefs, spiritual notions um, about how the world works. You know, this is a very distinctively human, modern human trait to tell stories about things that didn't happen, okay, about things that don't exist or creatures that don't exist in the natural world, not just the animals that they see in life, but, you know, the animals that they see in their own minds and, you know, that they tell these amazing, fantastical stories about. Uh, I've borrowed here these, these images from the very considerable, um, uh, what do you call it, fan art, I suppose, all focused on these Barbirusa, Barbie this endemic um, pig species uh, from Sulawesi. So these are made up images, of course, but I think it captures the spirit of, of what I'm talking about here. You know, these depictions of these uh, part human, part animal beings, which, which, you know, which, which we're finding from such an early period of time on these uh, cave walls in, in Sulawesi, which is, um, yeah, it was a really surprising discovery. I mean, you know, the moment uh, I received that WhatsApp text from my colleague in Indonesia, it just, it just really blew me away because it just, you know, you can see there was something amazing going on here, some really early story. And it was just, when we got the dates for it, it was, yeah, it was one of those special, special moments. Okay. So I'll touch a, a little bit upon um, what I think or some of my own notions about what, you know, what we're also seeing in this rock art in terms of what it's telling us about the nature of a human animal relations on the island of Sulawesi. I've already introduced these three endemic uh, creatures from the Sulawesi fauna. Uh, and we've now recorded something like out of, out of the 300 or so known cave art sites in, in this Maros casts, um, identifiable pre-Austronesian figurative motifs depicting animals. There's something, there's around about 85 of them, uh, of which 74 represent sewers, okay? So that's, you know, 
87% of identifiable animal motifs are of pigs in this early rock art style. I, did, I haven't had time to, to go into the, um, the design attributes that we're um, focusing on here, but it's, it's quite a distinctive um, uh, uh, rock art style, this early phase, which is quite easy to distinguish from the much later, much, much later um, rock art tradition introduced by the Neolithic farmers. Um, so these guys drew, the, these early humans drew lots and lots of, of, of pigs, painted lots of pigs. Anoas, we aren't, so far we've only found 11 representations of these dwarf bovids uh, uh, here. And when we're looking at the, um, the, the large number of sewered motifs, the large number of paintings of pigs, what we also find is quite interesting because um, oftentimes they show quite a lot of anatomical detail within the um, the within the animal uh, paintings. They're always figurative. Uh, they're always outline depictions of animals seen in side view or profile view, um, and uh, you don't see frontal depictions or anything like that. Uh, and it's quite interesting because they show the anatomical detail within the animal outline itself but there's no anatomical detail inside the outline. You don't see eyes represented or ears or, or muscle tone or, or coat markings or anything like that. Instead, you just have this sort of almost random um, uh, pattern of, of, of lines painted inside the um, inside these animal outlines. But either way, you can see the uh, anatomical detail in the outlines. And what we find so far, we haven't found a single clear morphological character of a Barbirusa in any of these sewered representations. Whereas we do find quite a large uh, number of images that show characteristics, anatomical features, physical features of Sulawesi warty pigs, including the distinctive facial warts, their distinctive head crests. Some of them have uh, toupee, almost toupee like fringes, which are really, really bizarre. Um, so, you know, based on these preliminary observations, and this is research that is ongoing, I have to say, um, but it seems that we, we, we haven't yet found a single clear representation of a Barbie Rusa, which is quite interesting because these are very distinctive, very enigmatic looking creatures, as I've said before, with the males having these bizarre recurved tusks. We haven't seen a single representation of anything that could be construed as a, as a male Barbie Rusa with their extraordinary uh, morphology. Uh, which raises the possibility that essentially all of the known um, figurative, rep figurative representations of, of sewers that we've documented in this Pleistocene rock art are of this single species of um, endemic warty pig, Sus celebensis, which is quite extraordinary. Um, now, I should mention as well, uh, during the excavations, we've excavated multiple, uh, several uh, Pleistocene sites in the same rock art region in the Maros cast, including their deepest excavations, our most long-term excavations are, are at a site called Leon Bulabetue, which is only a few hundred metres away from the main cluster of dated rock art sites. Uh, and here we found lots and lots of evidence for ochre use back to 40,000 years ago. You know, it's clear that they were processing lots and lots of ochre. Uh, and we find that they were, in terms of the faunal remains, these guys were, these early humans were really focusing on, on Sulawesi warty pigs. It seems to be the main, the, 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 the main large mammal species that they were hunting. Uh, not much Barbirusa remains at all. And in fact, the, the, the handful of Barbirusa elements we've found seem to have been used for symbolic purposes. They were extracting the lower incisors and then uh, sectioning the tooth roots. Uh, the, the, the roots of those incisors and making these um, disc shaped beads. Uh, and also we find that they were using other body parts of animals such as the, the bear cuscus, which is, a, um, which is a marsupial, endemic marsupial found in Sulawesi. And they were using some of the finger bones from these cuscuses and drilling holes through them and making uh, some form of necklace possibly. Um, so, you know, we know that humans, these early artists, Ice Age artists, had symbolic relations with, with other animal species uh, based on the evidence we found from the excavations themselves. But for whatever reason, in, the, in terms of the rock art, it was the, uh, the, the warty pig that they were really focusing on. For example, as I said, we haven't found a single image, clear image of a Barbirusa, and there's nothing that could possibly resemble a bear cuscus in any of the rock art. 
Um, and then when we fast forward through time to this Mesolithic-like population I mentioned earlier from ex that inhabited exactly the same cave art sites thousands of years later, they also focus very heavily on, on Susilabensis. Um, you know, this in terms of large mammal species, this was dominating the faunal assemblages of these Tawalian people. To the extent that some specialists have even suggested that there might have been some sort of incipient domest independent domestication uh, going on, not of Suscrofa, the you know, Eurasian wild boar, uh, but of this other endemic um, Sus species, Suscelabensis. It's a theory, of course, and there's no evidence to back it up at this stage, but it's a uh, interesting proposition, you know, that, you know, that the early hunter gatherers have had such a long term, extremely close relationship with this uh, with this, uh, I think they're very charming, these pigs, but they are <laughs> kind of funny looking. Um, but yeah, that, you know, it just seems that people have had a, a close relationship with these pigs for a very long period of time on the island. Uh, now look, to the extent where, you know, there's, there's been uh, some evidence or some arguments that uh, in terms of the, the sorts of animal species that are most commonly represented in the upper paleolithic art of europe there's been a, a an argument that horse essentially is the or was the unifying principle of paleolithic art in europe you know horse was the the creature that that <clears throat> that early europeans felt most connected to symbolically at least if we go by the um the the number and diversity of representations in the early cave art now if 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 we can accept this proposition then you know, in my opinion, we could look at the warty pig as the, you know, essentially the, 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 the reason for the existence of Ice Age art in Sulawesi. You know, if this is a, you know, this is a bold, yeah, this is a, you know, an out there interpretation, and it's just my my own speculation. But you know, these were these were a, a, a very important pig in terms, both in terms of the the a very important animal in terms of the economic life of these Pleistocene people, as well as it seems their, their artistic and possibly even their, their spiritual life. People seems, you know, they were besotted with this, uh, with these warty pigs. Okay, and then a final thought, uh, we return to the Ice Age map of, of my part of the world. Uh, and uh, we can see now based on the uranium series dating, we've got rock art going back to 40,000, 45,000 years ago, figurative art and hand stencils in, in Sulawesi. Uh, and, and on the Western side of the Wallace line in, in mainland uh, Southeast Asia, we've got 40,000 year old rock art as well in Kalimantan in Borneo. Uh, and then, you know, in the figurative animal representations that have been dated, in both of these regions are, are quite similar stylistically. Um, and it's very interesting to note that on the, uh, in the Sahul continent, in, um, in the northern part of Australia, in two rock art provinces, Arnhem Land and the Kimberley, we find quite stylistically similar rock art known from the, known from the very earliest phases of painted art in both of those regions. Uh, these are not particularly well dated at this point, although there has been some recent exciting dates from this rock art style in, in, Kimberley, in the Kimberley region, but they're, 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 they're quite similar stylistically, okay? So this is raising the, the interesting possibility that um, the northern route into uh, from uh, Sunda, from Asia, mainland Asia, continental Asia, into the Ice Age continent of Australia, um, that it, this could have been the pathway through which early modern humans brought this this very early tradition of painting animals uh, with them during their colonization of Australia, potentially up to 65,000 years ago. Now, again, I have to remind you that all of, all of the dates that we have for these uh, rock art depictions so far are minimum ages. Um, they could be much older for all we know. All we've been able to date is when the um, uh, the popcorn started to form on top of these images. So it is possible, I think, and, you know, we expect or we hope at least to find a uh, much older rock art uh, on this island, uh, Sulawesi, and potentially in other islands along the northern route, which are barely even explored at this stage. So thank you. That was a long talk. I uh, had a lot to fit in. Uh, I hope I didn't bore you too much and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Adam. That was that was really, really interesting. Um, I have a question, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you were saying that maybe the people on Sulawesi had had sort of like a symbolic relationship or like a, a obsession with the warty pigs. 
I was thinking, could it be that they were just really common? Um, and that's why people painted them kind of like, if you ask someone now to draw an animal, they probably draw like a dog or a cat, just because we see a lot of them, um, as opposed to having a sort of like symbolic relationship with them. Yeah, that's an interesting observation. Um, one of the problems I've been thinking about that a lot, and um, for example, with the the warty pig, they were we think they they probably were common on the island uh, when our species arrived. Um, but they're also, as far as we can tell, they're they're sympatric with uh, with Barbirusa. So that they Barbirusa and Sulawesi warty pigs tend to be found in the same environments. Uh, and they somehow manage to coexist. Well, they coexist, and you know, you know, oftentimes you'll see them at. Uh, well, I've never seen them together, but you'll see them feeding from, uh, you know, drinking from the same water holes and, and and other places like that, foraging in the same areas, and they seem quite sort of. They don't seem to be too bothered by each other, um, uh, mostly because Barbirusa tend to uh, uh, focus on fallen fruits. They mostly eat fallen fruits. They, they've got, uh, they lack the, 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 the muscle structure within the snout to do the, the usual digging and rooting that, uh, that pigs do. So they mostly eat fallen fruits, whereas uh, um, uh, warty pigs are much more generalist. You know, they, they eat virtually everything. They're, they're omnivores. They, they, you know, they eat everything from meat to, you know, to, to underground tubers. So they, I, I think they, they would have been found in the same areas. And I think when modern humans first arrived in Sulawesi, they would have seen these warty pigs together. But it, and, and also Anoas, the, the dwarf bovids, oftentimes you'll see them in roughly the same areas. Um, but yeah, I think I, the key, I think, is what, what, happened, what, what happened once they started hunting these three, these are the three largest endemic mammals on the island. You know, we have so little evidence from this, uh, from the excavated sites that we don't really know, you know, for example, modern humans might have started really intensively hunting the largest animal, which was the Anoa, and that might have rapidly depleted their numbers. And then they might have then moved on to the, the next biggest animal, the Barbirusa, and then depleted their numbers. And then it might have been the case that Sulawesi warty pig, they're very adaptable and a very hardy species, yeah, then proliferated. So it, it could be the case of what you're saying is correct. Um, but yeah, we, we need to do much more research and we really have very little idea of the, um, the distribution and just the, you know, the, the numbers of these creatures at such an early period of time. Mm. Okay. But if it was the case, I would say if it was the case that they were primarily depicting them just because of their relative abundance in the landscape, then it would still be difficult to, to you know, I think then they still, you know, they still had this strong connection with them perhaps even because of their ubiquity in the landscape, you know, like in the environment, it, that might have been, you know, it could have been a bit of a, um, you know, that was the reason why they were so important, who knows, but it's an interesting observation. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got a couple of questions in the chat. Um, Anthony asks, um, where is the art within the caves um, in the pharaohs? Is it, for example, in naturally lit areas of the caves? And um, how much variation do you see in the hand stencils um, size, uh, such as the size or representation of fingers? Uh, yeah, the art is mostly found um, in close to the entrances, close to the entrances of the cave art sites and in the rock shelters. Um, we sometimes, and, and within the light zone itself, uh, so it tends to be found in, you know, in the areas that, you know, seem to have been inhabited as far as we can tell, just by, you know, seem to have been the focus of normal domestic life as, you know, obviously that's a, I have no idea if that was the case or not, but it doesn't seem to be located in most, in most cases, doesn't seem to be located in, um, in sort of uh, liminal areas. Like you don't see anything so far, we haven't found any evidence for the really deep, um, uh, you know, like some of the, as you know, of course, in, in Europe, some of the cave art sites, I mean, they found, you know, a kilometre or so underground in these deep, dark cave passages. We haven't seen anything like that in, in uh, Sulawesi. The only equivalent that we might have is, uh, is some of the high level cave sites. I mean, sometimes we find, for example, that hunting scene <clears throat> was found in a fairly, um, uh, like a high level cave that's quite difficult to access. 
and which does not seem to have been the focus of any other habitation as far as we can tell. Um, haven't found any artifacts on the ground or anything, although there's not really um, a deposit that's formed there. Uh, and we see similar sorts of things in Kalimantan in Borneo, where people were making quite difficult climbs up these uh, cast towers and making cave art inside these high level caves that they otherwise don't seem to have been living in. So I suppose that would be um, similar to what you see in Europe, although again, <clears throat> even in these high level caves, they're always making the rock art within the light zone, more or less. It's only a handful of times we've found it in, in dark caves and again, fairly close to the entrance. Um, so, so yeah, that hopefully that answers your question there. In terms of the variability of the hand stencils, um, my Indonesian colleagues could probably inform you better about that who are, who are working on an analysis of that at the moment. Um, but we see um, uh, there's two types essentially. There's what we call the normal hand stencil, which just you know is the classic hand stencil. Someone placed their hand against the rock surface, uh, sprayed a mouthful of paint around uh, you know around the hand, and then you know that produced the image. Uh, we've seen possibly there's some where they were using a maybe a pipe to to uh, create a finer spray, but we haven't done any experimental research to substantiate that. And then we find another type where they did the normal hand stencil, and then it seems as though they slightly rotated the hand and then sprayed it again. That's one method, uh, and then that created these bizarre kind of otherworldly like um, hands with sort of sharpened fingers or tapering, slender tapering fingers. And they're very distinctive and uh, they kind of creep me out a little bit, actually. They look really weird, like these clawed hands. And sometimes they also modify them to only show three fingers. So that's quite bizarre. And in other cases, we see um, uh, where they they seem to, they, they're objects that they sprayed, that they they look like hands. So I don't know what they were. They might be combs or something like that. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of variation there and we're still trying to get a handle on it. Okay, cool. Um, Chris Springer has a question in the chat as well. Um, so some have suggested that Dennis Obens could have produced art. Um, what do you think about that possibility in ISEA? Uh, yeah, when we, um, we've, I've been asked that a lot, actually, uh, and that, that's what, a, a question I, I, I get a lot, we get a lot, you know, I mean, it could be the case, like in, you know, in uh, Europe with the, you know, with these, these claims of Neanderthal rock art, you know, but that was so, it could be the case that Denis Obens, um in this part of the world, or which, whichever species it was that, it, that inhabited Sulawesi, it's like, you know, before it seems our species. It could be that they were making the rock art. I mean, you know, hand stencils, maybe like you see in, in, in Europe with the Neanderthals, um, if those claims are substantiated. Um, uh, but I guess in my way of looking at things, when we're talking these quite sophisticated uh, naturalistic depictions of animals and, and, and narratives, these scenes, um, yeah, I mean, there's no way to prove it, I suppose, at this stage. But um, you know, my gut feeling is this is this is us. You know, um, just in, you know, I don't know, you know, but I mean, geez, anything's possible. Uh, I would be very excited if we find some. I mean, we have no idea, obviously, what you know, anything what uh, Dennis Sovens even look like, let alone their you know their relative cognitive capacity, say compared with Neanderthals, but. That would be a cool discovery. Max O'Bear, actually, he's always, when you get a few beers into him, he always talks, talks about his hope of finding a, a stenciled hobbit where these early humans held a hobbit up against the wall and, you know, sprayed <laughs> paint around them. That would be cool. Uh, but that, yeah, but at this stage, Chris, um, yeah, anything's possible, but I don't, I don't think it's the case. Okay, so next questions from Paige Madison. Um, she says, I'm wondering if you're on the lookout for new sites or do you and your team have your hands full with present sites at the moment? Uh, g'day Paige, yes, always on the lookout. Um, COVID obviously has disrupted things very significantly, but you know, those two key rock art, cave art sites we found, the, the one with the hunting scene and, and then the, the one with the three pigs, which dated back to 45,000 or so, these were found by our, our teams in Indonesia. Um, uh, you know, archaeologists graduated from the local university, the exceptional um, 
university archaeology department there and then uh and they're always exploring the uh this region i mean maros it's it's one of those amazing things maros is about an hour's drive away from makassar this ancient port city in the region and 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 the, and the focus of what i think is one of the best archaeology departments in all of indonesia and so it's always been this testing ground if you like for these uh very passionate uh, archaeology students they're always out there exploring it many sites have been excavated uh, you know just these amazing new rock art sites that are turning up each year from our team and oftentimes in areas that you know the the, the, the in densely populated villages where um you know there are these cave art sites that that no one had known about previously that are almost hidden inside these um you know, the, the densely vegetated limestone uh, cast towers. They're impossible to see from the ground. And uh, and we just keep finding them year after year. So we're always looking for new sites. And, you know, you know, just year, you know, since 2014, when we published the, the very first Pleistocene Ages, there was, you know, there weren't, weren't even that many figurative depictions of animals known from that rock art. And we've, I don't know how many more we've found now, but it's been lots. And, and you know, we're fi finding these beautiful, yeah, there's a lot of rock out there and there's a lot more to be found, not just in Sulawesi, but also in the islands uh, east of Sulawesi um, uh, on the, along the northern colonisation routes. Very rich rock art area. Okay, um, so Izzy has a question. Do you want to unmute? Yeah, I'll ask it. Thank you for such a great talk, Adam. And I've been following your team's work for a while because um, I'm doing my PhD in Upper Paleolithic uh, cave art in Europe. So really, really fascinating stuff. Um, and I've, I've got loads of questions, but I'll just keep it to one for now. And this is why I wanted to unmute and ask it because it's kind of long winded and I'm just excited about your talk. Um, but I'm always struck by how kind of detailed and um, sophisticated to use the term that's usually attributed to kind of later um, rock art in Europe. Um, these depictions uh, in Sulawesi are, and I was wondering whether you've got any thoughts about um, how that might challenge these uh, quite rigid um, stylistic chronological um, models we have for cave art in Europe, where we assume it's developed from quite a simplistic crude outline to these more naturalistic depictions that you're getting in in Sulawesi quite early on um yeah just your thoughts about that would be great yeah thanks Izzy um look I, I I'd have to I mean you would probably know better than me whether there's any um credence to this you know this long-standing notion um that the the cave art in Europe did develop from these early non-figurative you know abstract um, symbols and signs and to the more you know naturalistic uh, depictions of, of subjects from life which themselves you know became more sophisticated through time culminating in the in the you know just the amazingly lifelike um, animal art from the Magdalenian period but um, you know whether that's the case or not I don't know and and I, and I suppose Alistair uh, um, uh, Alistair Pike and Dirk Hoffman's research is now I guess reawakening that notion um, but with their rock art dates but you know in in Indonesia this is something that we talk about we we it, if that if that is the case if there was some sort of or if there is some sort of um, you know ladder of progress along which art develops um, then it appears to have been in its fully developed form as far as we're aware when it first you know when we first find it at least in in Sulawesi when it first appears in Sulawesi at 45,500 years ago minimum age we have the um you know this quite sophisticated naturalistic depictions of of animals in uh, in 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 scenes okay um so if if there was you know if there was some sort of progress well it, it seems to have already have happened um, by the time modern humans arrive in that region um, we do find, having said that, we do find non-figurative rock art in the same caves, which seems to be <clears throat> um, roughly similar in age. It could be older for all we know. At this stage, we haven't really seen any super, superimposition, you know, any examples of um, art, you know, one style of art overlying another. Uh, it's possible that they could be older, um, but we haven't seen any clear signs of that yet. Um, but, you know, yeah, as to whether that's, part of a wider um, 
pattern of you know artistic development I, I really couldn't say but it does make me wonder you know will we find um some sort of developmental phase evidence for some sort of developmental phase in Kalimantan in Borneo where we suspect this art you know first came from uh with the movements of early people across the Wallace line uh, but we just need to keep looking that area is very poorly explored so who knows what we could find there Great, thank you. I so hope much. that answers your question. Is it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Lots to think about. There is. Okay, cool. Um, does anyone want? Does anyone else want to ask a question? Um, probably have time for one more before we end. Um, otherwise, we can we can go ahead and end it there. Um, so thanks, Adam. That was really interesting. I'm sure everyone really enjoyed it. And thanks, everyone, for coming, even if it's earlier than usual. <laughs> no worries. Thank you very much, uh, Karis. And uh, again, Lucy, and thank you all for listening. And uh, good luck with your work. Bye, everyone.